Amen. Thank you, Zach. Good morning, church. Hey, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, For those of you that do not know me, my name is Jonathan Galvan. I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Redeemer. And um, if you are new to our church family, we started uh, a preaching series through the book of 1 Peter last, uh, last month and um, have been enjoying this book. And if you are new to the Bible, I wanna introduce you to who Peter is. Uh, Peter was a fisherman who grew up in the small town of Galilee and Peter's life was changed by Jesus. And uh, Peter ended up becoming a leader in the early church. And this book that we're reading, 1 Peter, is written to a group of Christians who were living in modern-day Turkey, which was a part of the Roman Empire. And the passage that we want to look at this morning, Peter is addressing an important question. And the question is this, how are citizens of heaven supposed to live here on the earth? How are citizens of heaven supposed to live here on the earth. You know, he opens his letter in 1 Peter 1, and notice how he calls the Christians. He refers to them in verse 1, to those who are elect exiles. If you look over at chapter 2, Pastor Jason preached on this last week, 1 Peter 2 verse 11, he tells, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Christians are strangers in this world. This is a temporary residence. This is not our home. And last week, Pastor Jason was speaking on Peter's command to the church to flee sinful passions. Christians must be different than the culture. People who've been who embrace Christ as the Lord of their life, who have repented of their, their sins, their lives must be different. That's the context of, w- of what we're reading. He's speaking to Christians. And in our passage this morning, Peter is encouraging Christians to live honorably in a, sci- in a society that is often hostile, dishonorable, and unfair. And he's pleading with the church then, he's pleading with us now to live honorably as Christians in a society that is often hostile and dishonorable. So let's turn to 1 Peter. Let's look at our passage for this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. If you're there, say, I got it. it. Here's what it says. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. This is God's word, let's pray together. Father in heaven, what a joy it is to get to gather as a church family and to look at your word and I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Lord, this is such a a relevant passage and has huge implications on our lives. I pray, would you allow our hearts and our minds to be attentive this morning? Would you speak to us through your word, we pray. As people said, amen. Church, I want to break up this passage into three parts. The first part I want is the what... The second is the why, 
and the how. That's how I want to break up this passage. The what, the why, and the how. Firstly, the what. What is Peter saying? What is the the thesis of this portion? The what is Christians are called to honor and submit to those who are in authority. The text is, is so clear about that in verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Who's just excited about that? Aren't you glad you came to church today? To the emperor as supreme, he says, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. The word submit is the main idea of this passage. This morning, we're looking at submitting to those who are in authority in government. But next week, we're going to be looking about what it looks like to submit as a boss, as somebody who works for a boss. In the weeks to come, we're going to be looking at submission in marriage. Submitting is the main idea of the, this passage. We will naturally struggle with the idea of submitting. Anybody else feel a little uh, not super excited about this? Kind of wishing you stayed home? And the reason that we struggle with this, it's a, it's a theological reality. See, we are sons and daughters of Adam. Rebelling against authority is as old as the garden. We want to do our own thing. This is a human nature problem. We don't even want to do what God wants us to do, much less why would we do what the authorities want us to do. And Peter is encouraging the church to honor those who are in positions of authority from the top to the bottom. Notice how wide sweep, sweeping it is. We read it in verse 13. He says, to the emperor as supreme or to governors sent by him. The idea is that Christians should honor civil leaders from the national level to the state level, to the local level. The world is quick to be hostile and quick to dishonor those who are in leadership. Our culture celebrates trashing leaders who are in government. Have you seen this? There are, it's amazing how many people entertainers, talk show hosts, who make their living by dishonoring people. They dishonor politicians. They dishonor people in various positions. We live in a critical society. We as Christians, we need to wrestle with what Peter is telling us this morning, what God's word is telling us this morning. Peter's reminding the church, we must be different than the culture. There is no if clause. Did you see if in the text? I didn't see it. If, it, if it's there in the Greek, I missed it. There's no if clause. Our obedience, our submission is not based on their competence or their morality. There's no if clause. I want us to consider what is Peter not saying in these verses? He is not saying that we should despair over those who are in authority. It's easy to despair, isn't it? When things are not going away, politically how you would like them to go. But that's not what Peter, how he encourages them. He doesn't encourage them to despair. And we'll see in a moment in the context here, they had a reason to despair. He's not saying that we should run away. 
If you look throughout church history, you'll see sex that are prone to isolation. It's not what he tells the church to do. But he's also not saying that we are to agree with all of their policies or their beliefs. That's not what he's telling us to do. See, he is simply encouraging the church as Christians, we are to honor those who are in positions of authority. Man, we should have our convictions. We should advocate for what is right. We should do those things. But at the same time, honoring those who are in authority. I want to take a moment to consider the context where 1 Peter was written. Peter is not writing during a time where things were perfect politically. Nero was the emperor at this time. Nero was a tyrant. You get an kind of idea of what kind of person he is when you learn in history that Nero murdered his own mother to secure his power. Doesn't that tell a lot about a person? And it was believed that Nero, because of his thirst to grow his kingdom, started a fire in Rome so that he could clear space to build out his kingdom. And Nero blamed Christians for the fire. As a result, Christians at this time experienced great persecution and were hated throughout the Roman Empire. This is the context that these words are being written. This is the emperor at the time. Nero would have Christians put in the Colosseum to be eaten by lions. That is the political dynamics that are at play. And in the midst of that persecution, in the midst of that injustice, Peter is telling the church, submit to those who are in authority. Honor the emperor. Wow. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, are there any exceptions? <laughs> Surely there's kind of a get at jail card that we could pull out right now, right, Jonathan? Are there any exceptions? What about civil disobedience? Is it ever right to disobey civil authorities? One of the great things about this passage is, is it helps us bring up two important biblical principles. The first biblical principle that this brings up is we are to obey civil government except when commanded to sin. We are to obey civil government except when commanded to sin. Can you think of any examples like that in the Bible where somebody decided to disobey the authorities? We could go all the way thinking about the book of Exodus, the Hebrew midwives. They disobeyed the order of Pharaoh when they were instructed to abort baby boys who were being born from Hebrew women. This is Exodus 117. But the midwives, it says that they feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. I think about Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar. They were commanded to bow down and worship King Nebuchadnezzar or be thrown into the fire. And Daniel, his friends, they said we would not do that. Peter is another great example. I said, Daniel, I was thinking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is a story. But Peter is another example of this. Acts 5, 29, Peter understood civil disobedience. He said this, we must obey God rather than men. Church, this is something that we need to have in our perspective. When the government prohibits us to do 
what the Lord commands or when it commands to do what the Lord prohibits. We must not obey. The second biblical principle that this brings to mind is that we should rest in God's providence over rulers and authority. That's the second biblical principle that this passage teaches us. We should rest in God's providence over rulers and authorities. If you have your Bible, would you just turn a few pages over to the book of Romans? Romans chapter 13. Let's read this together. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Listen, listen to Paul's instruction. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. Man, God's word is so clear. God is sovereign over those who are in authority. At times, God may put someone in authority who is a blessing to the people. At some times, maybe God puts somebody in, author in authority that is a means of trial for the people. Sometimes God puts someone in authority as an act of judgment. God has his purposes for why he allows what he allows. So church, we, we should be engaged in the political process. Man, we, we should be the ones as Christians advocating for what is right and what is just. But church, please hear me say it is a danger for us to get consumed by the politics of the day. Because politics can easily become an idol and provide us a false sense of hope and security. It is easy for a Christian to lose their minds over politics when they forget to see that God is sovereign over all kings and rulers. It provides perspective for us. Yes, let us advocate for justice. Let us be involved in the process, but let it be at its appropriate place to see it clearly. I was reminded this week of Psalm 146, three, the psalmist says, says this, put not your trust in princess, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. The Proverbs tell us, Proverbs 21, verse 1, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. This is what Christians are called to do. Peter's reminding us this morning through God's word to submit and honor those in authority. So that is the what. Now let us move to the why. Why should we submit? Let's go to verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 2. Listen to what he says. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Jonathan, why in the world are we supposed to submit to these worldly authorities? Why should we honor them? We, we read it clear as day, be subject for the Lord's sake. We serve and honor the Lord by submitting to those who are in authority over us. Christ is the motivation. We want to honor God. It's not for the emperor of the day why we do this, but it is an, as an act of worship. Can you, can you imagine that? When you follow the speed limit, 
You are honoring God. When you pay your taxes, you are honoring God. Submitting yourselves is an act of worship. A few months ago, we were driving to DFW and somewhere around Sweetwater, there was a bunch of road construction and it came to a halt. We were just kind of sitting there on Highway 20 for a couple of minutes and I'm, I'm getting agitated. Have you been there before? You're like, I got, I got places to be, people. And we're just locked in. And yes, I, I noticed some true Texans, you know, just cutting through, cutting through the path, you know, getting on the shoulder on the side. And I'm like, I'm going to do it. <clears throat> and my wife's like, you should just wait. No, we should, we should follow it. We should go, look, all these people, they're doing it. Let's go. And so of course, you know, got in our little minivan going off road on the dirt <clears throat> and pull on to the side of the, the the side of the road there, and sure enough, right when I turn on the road, I see from the corner uh, one of our deputies, you know, coming, and the lights turn on, and I get pulled over, and I hear one of my children in the back say, Dad, you should have followed the rules. I said, yes, yes. But church, just think through the, the teaching that Peter has given us, what God's word has given us. Is man, we're called to honor and to submit to those whom God has placed in authority. Despite their competence, despite their morality, we are being instructed, submit to them. Not for their sake, but, but God says, but for my sake. You're doing it as an act of worship to me. Obey those in authority. But he, he says, it gives us another reason why. What does he see it say in the passage? Verse 15, for this is the will of God. Have you ever wondered, man, I wonder what God wants me to do about this situation. This is one of those moments where he just tells you, this is my will. This is God's will that by doing good, verse 15, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. This is what God desires for us. Our obedience ultimately serves God's purpose. Our conduct, church, hear me. Our conduct is vital to our Christian witness. Our ethics, the way that we honor those who are in authority and submit to them, that is telling the world around us there is something that is different about those Christians. This is a missional passage. Just look at verse 12, the passage that Pastor Jason preached last week. Keep your conduct. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, honorable. So when that they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds, underline it, good deeds, and glorify God on the day of visitation. Look at verse 15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, underline it, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Let's move to verse 16. He's still giving us the reason why, but look at verse 16. He says this, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. See, I imagine that there are many Christian Americans who say to themselves, I'm free to do whatever I want. This is America. And I'm, by the way, I'm Texan. We do whatever we want. We are free as Americans, as Texans. Man, we're free as Christians to do what we want. 
listen to what Peter is telling them. Yes, you are free, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for what is evil. Yes, you are free, but don't take advantage of that freedom. Because before you are free, you are a servant of God. That trumps your freedom. We are free to obey God as his servants. So church, finally, how do we respond? What is the how here? I want to direct your attention to verse 17. Listen to, listen to what he says and listen to the order of how it's written. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. In, in a world and in a culture that is quick to dishonor people, that is quick to mock. Peter's instructions to the church, God's word instructions to us this morning is honor everyone. Our society kind of tells you who you should honor and who you should dishonor. And Peter's instruction is honor everyone. I wonder who in your circle are you quick to dishonor? I wonder if there's a family member, they just get on your nerves and you're kind of quick to dishonor them in your words, in your tone to them. I imagine that at work, there are just some people, they get on your nerves. You got some coworkers, you work with this person and you and your, your buddies, your friends, you're quick to dishonor them. Maybe you dishonor them behind their back. Maybe you do it to their face. But here as Christians, God's instruction to them is honor everyone. Every man and woman who is, is, everyone is made in the image of God. They have dignity. They have a worth. Honor everyone. But then he says to the church, the ecclesia, love the brotherhood. Do you love your church? I mean, you got to know the church. Be invested. Don't just come in. If you just come in on Sunday mornings and you sit and you don't talk to anybody and you leave, are you loving the church? Get to know the church, the people that God has given you. Love them. Serve them. It's much more intimate than everyone. You see, he says, honor everyone. But man, love the church, the brotherhood. Then he says, fear God. God is the only one you are to worship. God is the only one who you should fear. And then he closes verse 17, honor the emperor. In a world, in a culture that is quick, to dishonor those in authority. You know, I had a bunch of some illustrations that I could use that would kind of hit us close to home. But I, I think I'll just let you use your imagination. Man, the emperor for us, that's our president. Man, it's, it, it's easy to dishonor, honor him. Whether whatever party you agree with, but man, as Christians, we are to be different. So when, when you're at work and you're at home and they're talking about whatever political leader, I mean, you got some pretty nasty words to say about that person. We're not saying you got to agree with everything they believe. We're not saying that. But what God is telling us is we need to honor them because God has placed them there. So let me give you some action steps. Let me give us three quick action steps. What do we do with this passage? Number one, pray for those who are in leadership. 
pray for those who God has put in authority, whether at the national level, at the state level, at the local level. And it's not just politics. The church would fall into that. Local administrations, the school, it, it, the idea is all human authority, institutions created by man. Man, pray for those who are in leadership. Have you ever prayed for somebody you don't like? Anybody? Raise your hand if there's some people you don't really like. Yeah, everybody should raise your hand. Man, it's amazing when you start praying for those people. Isn't it amazing what God does to your heart towards them? It changes you. Pray for those who are in leadership. That's 1 Timothy 2.2. 2. God's word commands us actually to do that. Number two, be a good citizen. Pay your taxes. Abide by the law. Christians, that's what God is calling us to do. Hey, that is God's will for your life. Be a good citizen. Be a good neighbor. The writer Jeremiah says, seek the welfare of the city you're in. Man, be a good citizen. And lastly, rest in the providence of God. According to Romans 13, man, God ordains those who are in leadership. God has placed them there. And God is sovereign over them. We could just we could rest in that. Doesn't mean that we don't we're not involved politically or but we can rest in God's providence. So the passage is clear, church. We want to honor and submit to those whom God has placed in authority. And church, we are able to submit because Christ first submitted to the Father. The Bible tells us that Jesus, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. Jesus, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And we follow our Lord's footsteps. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for your word. A challenging word for us. Lord, because I am guilty, I imagine, with many in this room of maybe often dishonoring those who you have placed in leadership and authority. Lord, I pray for, for your help, Lord, as, as people who have been redeemed Christians, Lord, our lives should be different than the culture, and this is a great way that we can. So, Lord, I pray that you, through your spirit, your word would convict us and challenge us, Lord, to live differently for your sake, that we would o obey those who are in authority as a way of worship to you, Lord. Praise all in the name of Jesus. These people said.